all this dirt. No wonder the students leave frustrated. You, you know how I think, though, about these four levels? Maybe I'll give you some other ideas. I have these different grids in my own mind. What if I take content, material, and say to myself, you know, is this important or not? I, I sift it through different ideas in my mind. Gold, uh, silver, copper, dirt, or that's really a hot idea. That's, that's pretty warm. That's cool. <laughs> that's freezing. Or maybe you need to know. Nice to know. <laughs> who knows? And who cares? But it's the top one. And the, I hope by now that you know what really we've been calling this top one. The one that has the gold in it. We call it the irreducible minimum. This is what you, the teacher, must spend your time in class teaching and reviewing over and over again until everyone gets it. You know, teach for the gold. You've heard of going for the gold. Well, we believe you ought to teach for the gold. Well, what should you remember? What should you take away from this sifter? Now, let me give you a couple of them. Number one, always remember that um, you're responsible to shake the sifter. Never again just get that big bucket of content and throw it at them. Number two, always use what your sifter taught you. Always clarify for your students from now on, hey, this is the gold. This is extremely important. Don't ever again make them waste their precious time studying something you know isn't important, but they're not quite sure. And lastly, if you really want to be a master teacher, always teach from the top down. What's left in the top bin? The gold, the irreducible minimum, where the gold remains. That's the heart of the lesson. It's the gold. It's the essence. It's what a person must know to say that we know. Remember then, we call this the irreducible minimum. If you took any more of this away, the person wouldn't know. If you added anything to it, it's more than they need to know. And you know what, friends? <laughs> the real sifter. The real sifter is you. You're the sifter. You don't need one of these. So remember, from now on, take up your bucket and pour it through your sifter and watch the magic begin. And isn't that how God sifted through history? In fact, maybe that's why the book of Genesis skips literally hundreds of years of time without even one verse revealing what happened in that time and then all of a sudden spends chapter after chapter on Abraham, just one person, revealing detail after detail of his life. God skipped centuries and then wrote about minutes. Why? Because he was sifting history for us. Well, why in the four Gospels do we see dozens of chapters relating to what happened during the last week of Christ's life, covering just seven days? And we don't know anything about what happened between Jesus' 12th birthday and all the way until he turned 30. That's another sovereign act of sifting. Well, friends, if God practiced it, then why don't you? You see, master teachers know what to cut out, and ineffective teachers want to leave everything in. Let's move back over to maxim number five. Retention arranges the facts so they're easy to memorize. Retention arranges the facts so they're easy to memorize. In other words, if you are responsible to cause your students to learn the content, to memorize the material, then you should arrange those facts so they're easy for your students to learn them. For instance, let, let's say this is your material, your content, your subject, and here's all the material you want to present in a class period. Now the question is, how are you going to present this to your class? Here's how some teachers seem to do it. They just kind of throw it out there in front of the class. They do a content dump. Other teachers come along, and they take the next step. They, they uh, organize their content so it kind of makes sense. You know, Roman number number one right here. Capital A, capital B, let's say. Roman number two. And uh, 
Double number three. And small a. Uh, sorry, small small a. And small r, small b. There it is. And you know what? That's helpful, isn't it? And it puts it in a, uh, a good beginning. But you know, although that looks neat, although that looks neat, uh, how many of those letters uh, could, you could you name right now? I mean, can you remember? In other words, although you saw them, although I presented them to you, did you really learn them? Although I gave you the material, did I cause you to learn them? Let me see, how many are there? S seven of them. How many of them can you remember? You see, just outlining the material does not necessarily make it easy for the student to memorize it. All it does is it makes it easier to understand it. As a teacher, why don't I just take a minute? And after I've gotten my content together, why don't I come back around to that same content and um, work with it a little bit? You know, arrange those same facts so they're easy for you to remember them without even thinking about it. Take these same letters and uh, play with it for a minute. L, E, A. <laughs> Have any idea where we're going? There it is. It's learner. Now, can you name those seven, seven letters now? Yeah, it's, it's almost ridiculous. It's so easy. Well, why did that just work? It worked because we organized the material in such a simple way that without even thinking about it, you saw the word learner. Tell me the letters. Well, of course I can tell you the letters without even thinking. You see, my friends, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take your content, not only organize it, but then rearrange it and rearrange it to finally say, oh, that's a simple way to do it. All right? Maxim number six. Maxim number six states that retention strengthens long-term memory through regular review. It appears that God has created man with an ability of a short-term memory and a long-term memory. We use short-term memory all the time. When your spouse asks you to pick up three, three things from the store, or a friend just shouts across the parking lot, to call her tonight and, and tells you their number out loud and you don't have a piece of paper in your hand, what do you do? You say it to yourself a couple times and you have it. Or at least you have it for that night. You see, unless that content gets moved from the short-term memory, let's picture it in the front of your brain, back to the long-term memory, you haven't caused your students to learn the material. Maxim number seven states that retention minimizes time for memorization in order to maximize time for application. When you practice the law of retention, you will become more and more skilled in speed teaching your students. You'll soon be able to teach twice the material in half the time, so effectively that all of your students will master the content. Well then, what's the summary of all we've been talking about? What's the definition for the law of retention? Well, it's simply three words, three words. Master the minimum. Master the minimum. The teacher should enable students to enjoy maximum mastery of the irreducible minimum. I have to explain that a little bit. There's two words in that definition that need explanation. One is the word minimum. That is, the teacher needs to pick out, out of all the possible information, those pieces of information that everybody needs to know to say you know. That's the minimum. To say you understand, this is the part you got to know. That's the minimum. But then the first part of it is you need to help them master the minimum. That is, that everyone in the class learns that amount of it. I remember when I was teaching school, college, there was a class I taught that was a content class. That is, it was supposed to survey the entire scripture to freshmen to teach them the basics. And I did that. I identified the basics and said to them, if you attend the class and you're here every day, I will teach you the facts, and you will learn the facts, and you will get an A on the final. And the final will not be easy. So by the time that semester came back to a close, the day before the final came, I had the people stand up. And I said, guys, I want to hear the full review. And I sat down. And uh, I took off my watch and uh, started counting. They started at the beginning in unison. Uh, that's years ago. Bible, 66 books, two parts. Old Testament, 39 books. New Testament, 27 books. Old Testament, three parts. They did it in unison. 
and I counted the minutes that went by in unison. They sat down, screaming and yelling, 27 minutes later. I gave out six pages on the final exam, single-spaced. Every single person got an A. The academic dean got the grades, and he called me and said, Bruce, there's no way everybody in your class got an A. I said to him, Joe, can I show you the final and just to see if you think it was too easy? He said, sure. I said, okay. I gave him the six-page final. I said, Joe, what do you think? He said, what, what is this? This is the final. The final in the freshman class? Yeah. Joe, just check it out. You gave this? <laughs> Bruce, this is harder than seminary. <laughs> they knew all this? Yes. Do you think I should fail a few? <laughs> now, my friends, that's the way it ought to be. There was no threat of the test. Those kids loved it. I loved it. Why'd they love it? Why'd they love it? Because there was learning. Because finally, one teacher came along and said, Hey, I love teaching. I love helping you learn. And from now on, you're learning it. Of course, you couldn't do that unless you knew the seven methods God used. And if you're interested, I'll see you in part two.